So welcome to Kia Company's Coffee Talk. In this session, we're going to be talking with Sanchez Virgogia from Greyhound. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thank you for having me here, Duncan, and thanks to Kia Company as well for giving me this opportunity. It's wonderful to have support from industry experts like you. Well, it's great to have you here. So, so Sancha, I, I'm going to be asking you later on about the shape of, of the Greyhound organization because, of course, you're, you're chief analyst at Greyhound Research, but you've also founded two, two partner businesses, Greyhound Sculpt and Greyhound Technocrat. So it would be lovely to, to know something about that. And, and of course, one thing that, that makes you such an interesting person to be speaking to is your, is your background, you know, having, having worked at firms like, like Springboard, which of course is, is, now, is now part of Forrester, and, and also at IDC, you've got, you know, a really um, valuable background in the, in the analyst industry. So, you know, a real pleasure to have you here. So I, I wanted to start off a little bit by, by asking you about your background. Clearly, you, you're somebody who's a very um, entrepreneurial person. You started your yeah. first company when you were 16. Was there a, a point in your career when, when you decided to become an analyst, or, or did you sort of roll into it? <laughs> it's a very interesting question, Duncan. Um, I'm not sure how many, how many analysts in the Amsterdam sort of fraternity ever knew about the Amsterdam sort of fraternity in the first place. So, you know, uh, the same was the case here. I've had, a, I, I've had a bit of an interesting background. I, mean, I started out as an entrepreneur when I was all of 16, and I then went back to school to complete my education, you know, to only come back to start another company, which I sold again. So before stepping into the, to the world of technology as an analyst, and I spent nearly about 15 years across multiple industries and in retail, e-commerce, hospitality, consumer durables, professional services, you know, and I moved roles between sales, marketing, research, and strategy. And, uh, and, and when I did bump into this role at Springboard, it was actually one of my friends who was working at Springboard Research, and she was kind enough to introduce me. Uh, you know, I, I, it was an interesting experience for me because uh, I always came from the business side of life, and, and here was technology, and, 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 I, and I always thought that in the analyst world, we sort of saw the, the pyramid very inverted. We saw technology first, and then we saw business, and this is I'm talking seven years ago. Um, all of that apparently has changed today. Today we see business before, and we see technology thereafter. So I think my experience of jumping around roles, jumping around different industries, is coming to of real help to me today. Uh, you know, I spent uh, over five years with Springboard Research, and of course they got acquired by Forrester, and I also spent time with IDC. And, and what was interesting clearly was that a majority of these larger analyst organizations were very U.S. dependent, and I always saw that as a gap. Uh, and having worked a majority of my analyst experience in emerging markets, I always thought that uh, the analyst world had more to offer than just the traditional way we functioned in the analyst world. So yes, I bumped into the analyst world and, and gladly so. so. So let's talk about Greyhound. You, you founded the Greyhound Knowledge Group early in 2013. So what, what was your vision? Uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. Um, so 2013, I would say, was a year when um, you know, my dream nurtured, in, nurtured or finally over years into, into being. Uh, I started uh, in 2013 April, and the vision was very simple: to to challenge the, to challenge the conventions that there is no space or need for a new analyst firm in the first place. Uh, then to fill some obvious gaps in the analyst space, particularly in the emerging markets, and ultimately to to offer a lot more than just offering you know off-the-shelf reports to clients and uh, very shallow consulting work. And that's, that's what my thought was when I started out. And um, the three things that I always believed we would do and that continues to underpin uh, the values of Greyhound today, the first of all being you know, just offer the best quality in whatever we do, irrespective of the, the, the monies attached to it. Because typically in any organization, it's very money dependent. So if you buy 20 minutes, you only get 20 minutes from an analyst. And I did not want to stick to that model at all because I thought the, the, the need for uninterrupted access is super important. 
and that is continues to be a second most important pillar uh, of, of Greyhounds. We, we, we work very closely with our clients. We do not always have these rigid rules around 20 minutes or 30 minute calls. If need be, we go out of our way to help a client in need and uh, even, even, even offer extra and freebies sometimes. And, and last but not least, the third quality that I thought was very important is to keep, keep humble and you know, keep our business simple. Because more often than not, I always uh, heard from my friends in the industry that it's growing increasingly complex and expensive to deal with traditional analyst firms, and they're not really seeing the value come out of it. So, so you know, we've just followed these three qualities of uh, you know, offering the best quality, uh, giving uninterrupted access to our customers, and keeping humble and keeping our business simple which has really worked for us. And, um, you know, to, to be honest, we, we, we've got our fair share of accolades, but it's been important to just, you know, keep our heads on our shoulders and continue executing uh, on, on these tenets I've just spoken about. So, you know, I, the idea also was since inception that uh, we, we innovate and standardize our processes across all our client engagements. You know, more often than not, I saw in consulting engagements that we were repeating a lot of the processes that could have been very well standardized and a lot of the cost implications could have been saved as well. So it was important for us to innovate on the processes and standardize all our client engagements. Um, second of all, I think what we are sort of trying to do differently in the market is to introduce products that are really focused on emerging markets and focused on the roles that our customers are serving in their organizations. So they're not just reports or products which are very broad based in nature. They're products that help you solve a topical problem issue that you're struggling with if you're a company in emerging markets. Um, the third thing that we're trying to do differently is to make our advisory and services very relevant to our client's role and deliver on outcomes. Just to give you an example, all our advisory under Greyhound research is designed around sales, marketing, corporate strategy, and operations. Because a lot of our customers come from these different roles, and it's important for us to be able to serve their purpose in their organization. So we try and tailor our advisory services across their roles. And last but not the least, we are trying to add talent in multiple locations across the globe to be able to cover additional markets and also have, also have uh, further specializations. Well, thank you. So as I mentioned earlier on, Greyhound Knowledge Group consists of, of three brands, so Sculpt, Research, and, and Technocrat. Can you explain to me what the, what the difference is between those brands and, and why you've made that split between those, those three units? It's an interesting question because I never dreamt of it myself. <laughs> When I started out the business in April 2013, my idea was just to open an analyst firm. But as I started employing uh, experts in, in research, be it project managers or be it SPSS experts, my, my, uh, my request for research started coming outside of the technology domain as well. And there was a client we worked with very closely. This was a global major in cosmetics. We were working with them on a business research project and they had a problem in their IT. And we actually went with the project manager from the client back to the CIO and helped them solve that problem. Uh, that, that led me to the idea that we've got some strengths in IT and telecom, we've got strengths in research methodologies as well, and to be able to really tie in business to IT, it would be great to start working with our clients on business problems as well, irrespective of whether or not technology was an issue for them. So it's really helped us connect business to IT in the true sense of the word and not just uh, looking at it purely from a CIO perspective. We've also been able to sort of work um, with a lot of philanthropy partners in the market and help them use technology to touch citizens on the ground. So Greyhound Sculpt as a brand helps us touch the business aspects across different verticals in the market, which allows us to go back to the CIOs in these organizations and have a true business to IT conversation. Uh, from a Greyhound um, technocrat search perspective, it allows us to get a lot of data from on the ground as to what sort of um, you know, HR trends are you know, relevant to the technology industry. A classic problem that we've helped solve by one of our clients is where to source the big data expertise across the globe 
because they didn't know how to benchmark this expertise. They didn't know where this expertise existed. Another case that we helped solve our um, executive search clients was it's, it's an IT services firm. They wanted to establish a new SAP services support center in India and they didn't know which city to go to because they didn't know which part of the city, which part of the country has more SAP experts than others. So we helped them profile those cities a basis the talent pool available as well. So I mean, this helps uh, augment our understanding about the various IT skill trends in different countries across emerging markets. And uh, you know, we've, we've been able to help our clients with revised hiring plans basis the skills gap, the technology skills gap, while also helping them launch newer service lines and products. So again, it's, it's, help, it's allowing us to go beyond the traditional technology only research and help solve a business case in totality. That is very distinctive and, and quite unusual. And I suppose it brings me to a, to a slightly broader question. If we compare Greyhound Research to a number of other younger research firms in the market today, how is Greyhound different? I think it's been a number of ways. We've, I've seen the, the rise and fall of a lot of uh, research firms in the last few years in the market. And I think one thing that really stands out for us is that we're truly independent. Unlike many of our peers who continue to offer vendor-sponsored research, you know, we totally stand against it. You know, we strictly do not undertake vendor-sponsored research in any shape or form. And you know we don't do, for example, any co-branded white papers, any co-branded research papers. Yes, we do work with our IT and telecom vendor friends, but instead of offering uh, these co-branded research papers, we, we prefer to offer distribution rights for our independently authored research reports. Um, second of all, what differentiates us is that we're truly homegrown. So we, you know, we do not come to a wish to be a company that does it all, that knows it all, and we don't want to be global all overnight. We want to take baby steps to, to covering the entire emerging market. So we're chiefly focused on the APJ and the Middle East Africa region. We've been born and bred in this region. We understand this region very closely than many of our competitors as well. Um, also, you know, we're, we're new and young, and I think that's our advantage. Um, of course, we're not the first ones. There are others like Ray Wang and, and you know, Phil First, which have done, done a great job in, in sort of changing the landscape, essentially. But what really differentiates us is the fact that we're able to use a lot of these newer marketing tools we're, and go to the market very quickly with ideas. We're able to use social media very, very effectively, like many of our counterparts as well. So that's, that's been of big help to us as well. And, and also, I think we, we also truly believe in the power of communities. Okay. So as I said earlier, you know, uh, that uh, we actually use a community called the Greyhound Golden Gate, which is an exclusive community and invite only community for IT decision makers in, in emerging markets. We already have enrolled over 100 organizations in emerging markets, and these are senior decision makers who are CIOs and CMOs, and what we essentially do is to push out our research on a weekly basis to all of these, uh, uh, you know, all of these stakeholders in our community and share our ideas with them around our reports and our, and our blogs. So that's really helping us, you know, get on the ground detail as to what deals are happening where and what trends are emerging in which part of the emerging markets. Last but not the least, what really differentiates us is, is, is our other two businesses in the group, which is the Greyhound Sculpt and the Greyhound Technocrat, because as I said, when a business case is being formed at, at, at organizations, they're not just looking at technology-specific trends, they're looking at business-specific trends, they're looking at people-specific trends as well, and we're able to solve that problem very holistically. So I think these reasons really help us differentiate from the market. Obviously, your firm is, is, is based in India, but it's active worldwide. And I think that, that distinctive home means that you've got a number of opportunities facing you for how you can cooperate with, with other analyst firms. And I imagine it must also make the, the competitive dynamics extremely different for you. So how, how are you balancing up those opportunities to cooperate and to, and to understand a very different competitive landscape? I think that's a great question, Duncan. Um, today, we, we, we cannot live in an environment where we only compete with the other firms. And I mean, we have to learn from our 
taxpayers in the services industry, in the SI industry, who often come together for projects and cooperate. So, you know, as a young firm and, and, and you know, a firm that is led on newer tenants, it, we can actually go out and, you know, follow a policy of cooperation where at some stage we actually cooperate with a lot of our peers in the industry can, uh, and actually in, in the, same, the same breath also actually compete with them on some projects as well. And that, that sort of alliance I believe is super critical to sort of help overcome the volume and the access gaps that we otherwise would have if we are to go out to you know, compete with the biggies like Gartner and Forrester. So uh, truly I believe the, today the world is meant for cooperation and uh, the smaller analyst firms must sort of live together to thrive together. So uh, I mean I would love to get your opinion uh, a little bit more broadly on, on trends in the whole in, in the whole market. I mean obviously you're, you're somebody who's got several years experience but also you know very interestingly across different organizations. How has the research landscape changed over the over the course of the of, of of your time in the industry, and I suppose particularly over the last couple of years? I think the last couple of years have been very exciting for the analyst world. Um, clearly, the change is uh, very evident now. You know, clearly we are one of the younger entrants in the market, but this wave, as I said, has been pioneered by the likes of Ray Wang when he launched Constellation, or Phil Fess when he launched process for sources and many other great analysts who have actually branched out and uh, I think truly this is um, this wave is helping level out the IT analyst world and newer players like us are helping clients with fresher perspectives and opinions in addition to those offered by the more established players like Gartner and Forrester because definitely there's a need for a second opinion outside of your traditional opinions that you get from a Gartner or a Forrester. So clearly, I think um, the, the analyst world is changing, the business models are changing as well. Um, and uh, some, of, some of the newer guys like us in the market are able to offer uh, you know, better business models sometimes as compared to our industry, uh, industry giants like Bach and Forrester. And I mean, has, does that mean that the business value of research has also changed over the last few years, or, or maybe has the potential business value of research changed over uh, over these years? I think um, that's a very that's a very great question on a, on a couple of accounts. Um, a couple of years ago, when we used to go out and pitch for consulting assignments or you know research projects, um, the questions used to be very different. Today, the questions are very different. The kind of questions I'm posed on a daily basis is, um, you know, with, with Google and social media really democratizing information availability, why do we need to spend on research and advisory services that are not necessary because you know there's no compliance or regulatory purpose that they solve? The second question we often get is that uh, does this research really impact my business? Is there a clear tangible outcome that you can define for my business? The third question that I often get is that can you help me prove a return on investment on the research spends that I do? So clearly the, the demands from research and the outcomes from research have changed. The traditional research continues to happen for sure but the, the clear need for outcomes is very important. So clearly what we do with our customers, uh, Duncan, is to first educate them that, that just the fact that there is more data available in the market that does not make your job easier or that does not make research redundant. While there are multiple data sources, the challenge actually lies in filtering what is relevant to the organization and what is very relevant to the business problem at hand. Also, second of all, what we try and do best is to sort of offer research and advisory services which are very relevant to the company in the industry they're in and the geography they're in because it's super important to align the research to the business outcomes. And more often than not, it's important to get in, sort of get in touch with not just the market research head or the, the research project head at the client end and actually speak to the project owner, the the, the business owner who's ultimately funding the project to better understand the outcomes they're looking for. So I, I, again, I can give you a classic example. We were doing a research, a recent um, satisfaction study for, a, for, again, for a global cosmetic giant. And the product feedback helped us understand that their product was not serving the need for the current market. 
and of course the, the, the entire inventories as well were missing. So we were able to solve multiple issues around product availability, how does it go to the market, how does it touch distributors, and the CEO of that company clearly saw a lot of value coming out of it. Uh, also I think traditionally analysts have been in research broadly has been taken more as an activity of a one-way process as to you try and influence the the people who are writing this research to to ensure your name goes out in the market but I truly believe that the role of research is a lot more strategic now because in, in a lot of times we analysts actually help create new market opportunities we help look a lot of times create new technologies as well. So I think uh, those days are gone when you can just simply use research or analysts as just as a source of information, or just as a source of a research report. It's a, it's a two-way street, if you may, and there's need, there needs to be a engagement built over time with the right analysts to ensure you know you can probably come up with a new product, you can come up with a new uh, market need and also actually think out of the box and you know, do something different in the market. I think there's something very interesting in the way that you pose it, and, and I think that, that example of the, the project that you did with the cosmetics company is, is, a, is an excellent illustration of the way that industry analysts are often being used for, for some quite strategic questions. And often clients come with quite open questions, yet paradoxically, uh, certainly for our clients who are, who are IT suppliers or, or services firms, they are really focused on, on the sales cycle, you know, and, and they are focusing on industry analysts impact on, on requests for information, requests for proposals, shortlisting, final decisions. And I wonder, I mean, in, in your experience, you know, where, where do you think analysts are having the most impact? Yeah, there's no silver bullet to answer that question, honestly, Duncan, but it totally depends on the engagement at hand. Um, you know, a lot of clients have their own internal strengths, and they also have their pockets of weaknesses. Um, sometimes these clients are also deemed to get external experts to vet as a third party. So, uh, you know, a lot of times we, we work with our clients across multiple parts of the sales cycle. They sometimes only come to us in the end when they have sort of benchmarked a few vendors and they want us as a final a part of the vetting process. But I, I truly believe that uh, that needs to change. The, the earlier the external advisors come in into the sales cycle, the better it is. I'll give you another classic example we faced recently. So uh, a, a media organization in, in, in the Middle East was trying to benchmark a storage provider. It, it sort of kept away three of the storage providers thinking they didn't do the job really well and only asked us to benchmark two storage providers. But in fact, it was one of the three ones that had not been included as part of the process that was actually the right fit. Uh, now, it was too late in the process to be able to advise to them that the, the, the benchmark should be technology first and then the financial and not vice versa. So they actually went after the costing first and then they wanted us to technology benchmark these vendors. So I think that, that needs to go through a fundamental change. A lot of, um, a lot of organizations still you know, do not really believe consultants and analysts like us can offer help throughout the sales cycle. So the traditional mindset does, um, does come into place multiple times. And, and I wonder if that, if that also means um, that, that timing has to be different now for, for when vendors are choosing when they should start to engage with analysts. Yes, and I think that's so true as the, as the industry is evolving the, and the sources of information are increasing. You know, lots of analysts like us have blogs as well. So the, the vendor community ends up getting confused as to when to engage and when not. Uh, truly engaging with analysts requires a clear strategy, it requires a plan, and it definitely requires experts like yourself to be part of that conversation because often vendors make 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 grave mistakes uh, you know there's some there, there are some vendors who either completely leave out the analyst community and not engage them in either fear or either in um, in ego they also sometimes use their public relations arm to engage analysts uh, just like they would engage media and bloggers 
um, you sometimes they even make the mistake of uh, you know confusing analysts with bloggers. Or at worst, I've had I've had situations personally where I've had vendors approach me to behave like a broker of a deal, and uh, or just as a method of reaching clients. So you know, all of this is nothing short of a disaster. I feel so. It's important for marketing heads to engage the right experts from the early on when they want to design a new administration strategy to ensure they can best serve the company's interests and also have the right name in the market among the right analyst audience. I think there's something else that I would add there, which is the, the need to actually understand you know, which analyst you should be speaking to about what. Because to take the example of, of, asking, you know, of asking analysts to kind of intercede, perhaps in a way that some people might consider unethical, you know, to intercede into a, directly into a deal. Of course, there are some analysts who would run towards that with arms open, and it, it can be disastrous. Sometimes I, I see clients asking, asking analysts to do things, which perhaps some analysts have done, you know, and, and that's why they feel comfortable asking every analyst to behave in the same way. But, you know, it can produce, uh, you know, that the, there's, a, there's, a, there's, again, quite a paradoxical uh, dynamic there, which is, you know, there's all, there are always some analysts that are, going to, that are going to pick up on the least reputable opportunities that are available in the market. And, and unfortunately, that educates analysts to behave in that way. But of course, that also produce, produces pressure for other analysts to, to, to operate with clean hands. And yeah. so, you know, that, that actually makes it more dangerous for vendors. You know, the more they pressure analysts to behave in unethical ways, the more they will be punished by analysts who want to keep their hands clean. So I think that's the paradox that people are facing. Very well, um, very well said, Duncan. Sanjay, one last question for you, which, which, which may be, I don't know, maybe it's more than one question. But for companies looking for, for international expansion, how important are relationships with analysts? I mean, I'm, I'm sure that you will have a unique perspective on this, partly because of your, of your, of your you know, knowledge of the Indian market. In, in particular, I wonder how important is it for people to build relationships with local analysts? Because it may even be unclear to people how many analysts in a local market are focused on the local market. Yeah, I think it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult one to solve, Dr. because um, to be fairly honest, if you were to compare the profiles of analysts across uh, emerging markets, there's, there's a mixed profile. You'll find some excellent analysts in, in, in lots of these local markets, and um, but then a lot of the junior analysts don't tend to know much outside of the usual small little trackers that they do or the small little areas that they track. So it's got to be, I think, a, a, um, a mixed strategy wherein you engage both international, your home turf analysts who can advise you on technology, and also some very relevant analyst bases recommendations from industry peers who, who tend to have some on the ground knowledge. So I think relationship with analysts and, you know, at times can be a great differentiator for vendors trying to enter new markets. Uh, Clearly, I think uh, analysts can not only help you build and understand a new market, but it can also, you know, help you engage the stakeholders in the new market using marketing tools like, you know, event platforms or blogs or um, traditional and social media. But the point is that um, not a lot of vendors often consider using analysts aggressively to help build their profile in newer markets. Um, they, sometimes it's the lack of an expert of, on, on analyst relations at the vendor's end that, tend, that tends to make them spend more on marketing and or advertising and not really engage with the analyst community. And uh, it's also sometimes wrong advice because sometimes um, vendors, when they enter newer markets, they tend to tend to refer to the public relations consultant that they have appointed as an organization or an individual who might not know much about the analyst fraternity in the local market in the first place. So I think it's the change in, uh, it, it's a change in the mindset, first of all, as to how an analysts can impact your mind share, can help you drive revenue and stock value. And also, more specifically, it's important to get the right advice from the right people. So recommendations can really go a long way in helping you, first of all, have a strategy and then engage the right sort of analysts for you to create the right sort of noise in the desired audience. So yeah, that's my, that's my perspective. Well, thank you very much. Sanjay, there's one last question that, that comes to, to, to mind. And I think one of the things that I think you have a unique um, knowledge of is, is analyst impact in the, in the Indian market. 
and I know that, that many people get extremely confused about about the dynamics of analyst influence in the Indian market because of course many analysts who are in India have got a global remit often they're working as part of global teams that have consciously chosen to build up their capacities uh, in the Indian market and, and right. I think that it's, it's very unclear to many people if there are analysts that are really impacting IT purchasing by businesses in India I think it's even more opaque in the Chinese market. But can I ask you, what, what's your feeling about, about analyst influence now in the Indian market? And, and how do you think that, maybe what sort of firms might that be changing with? I think that is a super question. And that, that makes me really happy. And I'll tell you why. Because uh, not an awful lot of analysts in the country, uh, in, in India, uh, are really dedicated to the profession in the first place. They enter the analyst world. They are part of the global, you know, capability teams, if you may. They do sort of, uh, you know, feed in a lot of data-specific work. They're not really analysts who understand technology uh, or understand business cases. Of course, there are a few good ones, of course, right? But the bulk of the analysts that come through are very data-oriented. And, and sometimes they use the analyst role because analyst role offers you a very large amount of uh, external visibility, if you may, to use that as a stepping stone for probably getting into the vendor side. Okay. That's probably the end of the analyst career. So most of the peers that I sort of worked with in the past um, have sort of ended up their career uh, in the vendor side. And uh, so first of all, I think there's, there's dearth of the right, right analysts in India for sure. Uh, there are very few organizations who are even ready to um, take the right independence approach to the market and not be influenced by vendors dramatically. Sanjit, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Thanks so much for your time.